go hand in hand with foundational reading. The, um, so in this case, we'll talk a little bit about just not getting into certainly the science of reading, but how that we've used this as the way we coach and mentor K3 teachers, and then also supporting teachers around mentorship to identify strategies that engage students. <clears throat> Our sense of urgency when I think about when bringing this partnership to CSRA RISA, the sense of urgency is really grounded in the research that we think about. And I, I know that if you have any association with the Get Georgia, uh, with Dill Center, you also are familiar with Get Georgia Reading. But when I think about the research that comes from that work and just what I've come to learn from being a part of Get Georgia Reading is that double jeopardy, how third grade reading skills and poverty influence high school graduation. So what we really know is the importance and priority around reading. And in my RISA, when I look at overall in my RISA, back in 2019, the last time that they gave the milestones, and I don't have the most recent data, of course, it's populating as we speak to those districts. Um, and, and we haven't even, and when we, in 2019, we weren't even considering the pandemic and the those things that impacted education. Our region only averaged 36.2% of third graders reading proficiently at that time. So again, here's our sense of urgency around compacting, um, compounding the fact that if students aren't good readers, if they're not grade level readers, they're not college and career ready. So again, or right then, it doesn't mean we can't do a lot of work to support them, but we know when they're not on grade, grade level reading by third grade, that work's gonna get more and more difficult and the odds of students really gaining those skills become less and less. It's just the reality of our work, but that's our sense of urgency. And again, I'm just showing you briefly a screenshot of the work that we do in our RISA and why reading, foundational reading and capturing kids from the very beginning. And I just have this little mantra, it's not mine, I stole it, saw it on a billboard once in California, but we need to be read, we need to read, sing and talk to our children. And so as educators, as people who know, this is the messaging we tell our young people, a new parent, whoever those are that learn about the foundations of reading beginning at birth. So again, it's all about this urgency to, to um, it's deeply connected to well-trained reading teachers. And again, even when we think about student engagement, it's that we want our reading teachers, all teachers of course, but especially here are concentrating on reading teachers to be well-trained in reading but also well-trained in how to engage students. As we think about our own work, we can't help but think of our own stories and how we get here. So just briefly, again, Garrett told you a little bit about my story, uh, working just briefly for the DOE on when, I, when I retired from the Richmond County School System after many years with them. But my story really begins with a young, as a young teacher coming into, I was a history major, a lover of reading. I would have probably been a British lit teacher had I not had to do a lot of writing at the time. When I was young, I was thinking, oh, I don't wanna teach writing. I don't wanna read a lot of papers. I just wanna read books. I wanna open the world of reading. Um, the Canterbury Tales and all about, you know, uh, the various things and the um, different, um, from British Lit, that was just a love of mine. However, and just literature in general, I was kind of probably a reading nerd and would see how many books I could read over summer break and was the kid, you know, in the back of the class probably reading and under with a flashlight in my bedroom at night reading uh, the next book all my life. And, but I really, had no concept that many other students, although I certainly saw students in my school who might have struggled with reading, but as a child or, or a fellow student, 
I didn't understand what was happening. Sometimes we just think, oh, they're just slower than everyone else, or they maybe they just didn't catch on, or they didn't do something that they should have done. I didn't have any knowledge. And so coming into to being a teacher, I had no knowledge of what it takes. I just knew what my teachers did and it just worked. And then even as I grow, grew older as a parent, I saw what teachers did with my own children. And so then I'm just thinking, even as an educator, taking this for granted that teachers just know what to do, that it comes natural. It's something they're learning or they're gifted at, not really understanding truly the need. So when I began my teaching in high school history and then later into middle school social studies and and though in as part of my teaching career, I really realized then that students, because I can remember one of my first years teaching in middle school, which would have been a very long time ago now, well before we were doing any standardized testing other than like some state test, I mean like national testing, like I, I, the Iowa test. I never realized and had that connection back then of what that was telling me about my students or even about my own practice. So well before that time, I started seeing that I had a heart for the kids, myself, for those who were not on grade level. My favorite group to teach back then in Richmond County, we taught um, a curriculum again, a reading series, and everybody in the whole middle school taught them. And I always had level, the level 11s. And in seventh grade, level 11s were those that were reading on the fifth grade level. So even then, we had kids reading two or more grade levels behind. And when I think about the fact that I knew very little about teaching reading, I just knew how reading impacted my life and how it could impact the others. It was a long time and a journey for me to really learn about reading, but think about those teachers in our classrooms who have to know this now. Well, over that journey that I had, I just was, a, I really, from the very beginning, had a heart, not saying anyone doesn't have a heart for kids, but I had a heart for those kids that other people really didn't want to teach. I would see kids get kicked out of class. And again, right away, I was attracted to those kids who were struggling readers. Even though I didn't have the tools to help them really uh, in what I know now, I just wish I knew what I knew then, know now what I knew, I wish I knew then what I know now. But what I did realize that many of my students were having behavioral issues. They were struggling. And so while they might not have gotten the attention they needed around the skills that they needed to build. They were getting attention and a lot of times it was discipline. And I remember once uh, attending a conference and this was, I, I mean, I'm giving away my age today, but I remember, cause I started teaching in 1984, but I remember in 1996, I was teaching I had just finished teaching a high school program where we brought overage middle school students to this program. I remember at this high school, I got into this program. It was called an ALPS program, just an alternative learning program for students. But I had 18 year olds coming out of a local middle school. They have come from seventh and eighth grade, coming to the high school where we need to build their skills. And again, trying to build just middle school curriculum and allowing them to do high school, very innovative for the time. But I also realized how much difficulty these students were having. And I attended a conference and someone shared this quote, which has been on the screen. So I know you're probably, your eyes have been looking and it's not new. But when I realized after being a teacher for more than 10 years, probably, that it was me who made a difference in my classroom, it was my approach to students, I had the power as a teacher to heal or to hurt, then we start to resolve many things that we've had perhaps happen to us as educators when we were children. 
Because sometimes we become teachers because we want to do something different than have. I've heard that story from many. But this quote became something that I began to really look at on a daily basis and really reflect on daily what, were, what was I doing to really impact and empower the lives of my students. And again, I'm not reading you that quote, but I hope that if you've never seen it, sometimes I find people um, that haven't heard it before. But again, for me, it was one of those when I saw that, and certainly many times in our faith, we think about our approach uh, to students and what our commitment is to helping others. But when I read this, it just put it into a solid uh, change of heart for me that I had to do more than just what I was currently doing to help my students. And while I had a heart for them, I knew my work was so much more powerful around that. And it just began, began to guide me. And I think that this is where my heart really goes when I think about my connection to the Deal Center today and this powerful work that we have to go on to ensure that every child has a well-trained reading teacher, but also one who knows how to connect with them and engage with them. So again, this work, and again, no accolades to me, everything that I am, I owe to other people and to the children and families that I've been blessed to meet. But one of the things that happened in my life, and I guess if I was really smart, I would have started keeping a journal and have a book. But when I became a principal uh, in a little elementary school in Richmond County called National Hills, it's closed today. They use it as their professional learning site. The very first day of my principalship, uh, the local Augusta Chronicle came and shadowed a new principal. And these little girls in this picture you see came running out for this photo op. I had no idea their names. It was my first day, even if they told me I was overwhelmed. And, but what I didn't know was this picture would follow me throughout my life because I was able, these little girls in second grade, I was able to go with them when they transferred to middle school a few years later. After that, I went with them to high school. And when they graduated in the class of 2013, I had been their principal for 10 years. So I can tell you that statement that I learned there, if I had not taken that opportunity to reflect on my responsibilities as an educator, I don't think I would have had the opportunities that were afforded me later. I really do believe that my attitude going in had an impact on that. But what I saw over that time was the power of reading and when our students aren't on grade level. I got to know these people intimately. And so the second picture you see there with one of those students and the little girl over, I guess from your, um, on our, all of our right with the little pigtails there, you can see just uh, my hands or class with hers and on her shoulder. This is the same girl that you see in as a senior and probably my last day as a principal. And um, sadly, this young lady went on to Kennesaw State but was killed in an automobile accident. And uh, I had the honor, I, I'm gonna call it now an honor to speak at her funeral. But all of these young ladies, many of them gone on to become mothers and professionals. And uh, I've kept in touch with some of them through the years. But again, this is what I want for every teacher. And, I, and we know when we're building the capacity of our teachers as reading teachers, this is how we get to the heart of them also connecting with their students. And I can't help but think about my story and what brings me to this place today. So again, when I think about my story, I can't think, I can't neglect this connection. And by 2015, or even before that, I had come to the district office in Richmond County, and I had spent my whole life here uh, in that county. And I knew there was hard work, things that we had done, but it seemed like 
as I was taking the lead for instruction in our district, it seemed like there was a missing link, that there was something missing in all that we were doing. It wasn't in programs. We were a very large district with 56 schools and 32,000 students. We had fi financially, while you had to budget and be frugal, you, it wasn't the money because we had Title I dollars. We had school improvement funding. We had SIG grants at times. We had um, the um, you know, various grants that would come with our funds and various things that had happened over the years. So I knew something is missing. And one day in 2015, and again, I had attended a conference out in California and saw that billboard that said, read, sing, and talk. And I was like, where is Georgia's campaign around this? And again, we all get isolated into our districts, into our jobs, and we only know what we know. I began to look, and when I looked just for Georgia's campaign for reading, I landed on Get Georgia Reading. And I called uh, Ariane Weldon, the director, who's also doing a, a workshop here today or doing one of these keynotes. I called her, and while I thought I was going to tell her about Richmond County and the work we had done, I sat there for the next hour and heard her tell me about Richmond County. Because while I looked at education and reading and the support of students in isolation, I learned quickly that we will not solve this problem of students not reading on grade level in isolation. It's going to take more than educators because it starts at birth. It starts in our communities. And so from, for me, I learned quickly about the barriers that many students were facing, and not that I didn't know them, because I taught in schools that were very high poverty, some 100% poverty. Uh, with, I knew the situation of many of my students. So it was not that I wasn't aware, but I didn't know the data, and I didn't know the real facts. I could remember times when my principals as a teacher, when I might go there and we would ride through our neighborhoods and visit our housing projects and various things to do the work, but I wasn't making the connection that students weren't getting from the beginning, all of them weren't developing the skills they needed in order to be successful. Of course, I knew a lot of these things in isolation, but I didn't realize how they all had to come together in order for us to start to solve these issues for students and really wrap around them. So we've all learned these things. You, many of you have been on this exact same journey that I've been on. Uh, so you're not, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but what I do hope I'm doing today is reviving your story. Cause I think we do have to tell it because we're in a situation now where everyone doesn't want to be a teacher and finding teachers is becoming more difficult. So when we get them, we have to be sure we're building the capacity, not only to love students, because I hope that's what you see as a thread here, but that we really are well trained and able to support our students with the knowledge around foundational reading and the knowledge around how to engage them. So again, these things, I mean, just imagine, this was well before the pandemic uh, that has impacted our uh, communities and students and each of these issues continue to be, uh, and when you look at that entire list, become, begin to be powerful. But again, back then, this is when I, got involved really with um, Get Georgia Reading. I learned about the Deal Center and the work going on there. And then just fortunately, when I joined the um, Georgia Department of Ed, the um, Chief Turnaround Office for a brief period of time uh, between my retirement and taking on the role of Executive Director uh, at CSRE RESA, I really had this opportunity to get involved at the Deal Center and this work around literacy mentors that would come into schools and support K-3 reading and reading teachers through coaching and mentoring them. So again, 
this and, and all of us joining together for this campaign. Again, this is what really our work is all about. Uh, students being able to read on grade level by third grade. So with this partnership that I've been able to do over the last two years, because I came to CSRA RESA in July of 2019, I keep reminding myself that, wow, we had only been, I'd only been there. While I certainly was familiar because CSRA RESA certainly uh, served Richmond County because we were large, we didn't always utilize um, the supports they had there as, but I certainly was always familiar and really, uh, really had in my heart that if I ever could go back and not knowing so quickly that a posi the position would come available, that this was really my heart to go back to be able to support teachers. So in this uh, period of time, we were able uh, to, we've been able to um, participate with the Deal Center in their collective impact grant initiative. And with that, we really had this combination of this language and literacy mentors and the SEEKS project. And I'll tell you a little bit more about SEEKS. Again, if you are familiar with the Deal Center, familiar with Get Georgia Reading, you are no stranger to Seeks and Emily Rubin. But again, combining these two initiatives within schools was, is the way that we're really working to impact K-3 teachers in their practice around foundational reading. So again, in this, again, uh, I believe following this session, there's one that actually Garrett and other um, other uh, people from the Get Georgia, from the Deal Center will share about um, the data they've been collecting. So certainly our schools that participated in this work are part of their uh, data collection. Uh, and that's our trade-off. While my team gets to really uh, support teachers um, through the Deal Center work, uh, really the trade-off is that the schools then also allow them to do some data collection. So really within, uh, I'm not going to go into what we've done in that, but really our work centered around uh, the fact that low reading achievement um, and really um, around this particular impact that we believe that impacting teachers in K-3 will pay off dividends for, for students in the future. And so really uh, working with that, these next few slides, and you'll have these, I'm not going to, uh, to read them to you, but they really just tell you who was a part of our grant, which also um, seeks to scale this kind of work. So I hope that, again, many of you will become interested in how you can do this work um, just within your own organizations. But again, a lot of our work concentrated just within schools, but also within regions, uh, other RESAs uh, sharing the work, also then um, being able to then scale that, like I said, statewide, especially um, the work around SEEKS. Um, foundational reading, again, from the Deal Center, we believe in the uh, reading, the science of reading. Now I'm hearing a lot of times some, I'll be truthful among some of our colleagues, sometimes I'm hearing some negativity around the science of reading, but I wanna be clear that the science of reading is not a curriculum. The science of reading is a body of research around reading. So we do wanna be really clear about it. And I couldn't really uh, not share, excuse me, let me go back one. Uh, not share with you um, the fact that this Scarborough's Rope, which is the work of Dr. Hollis Scarborough, um, really was actually an image that she designed. She works very closely with the um, International Dyslexia Association, uh, which we really support in our work. But really, she designed this rope so parents could understand how reading works. So it's not to be some, you know, it's not a mystical thing that we all have to go like, whoa, what does this mean? She really just took what foundational reading means and the work of foundational reading and how each of those, the language comprehension and then word recognition works to wind together and bind together and actually build 
the capacity of our brains around that neuroscience of the brain, which again, you can quickly go and look at the work that she uh, that shared around this reading rope or Scarborough's rope, whichever you wanna call it, to actually develop skilled readers because much of her research is around the fact that what happens from early learning to later reading. And I know for many of us who work with fourth through 12th grade or even adult literacy, we often think about how can we go back and support it. Really the science of reading is saying is every one of those components is important. And I know for me, probably as a child, I was, we, I was raised probably in the days of sight reading, the whole Dick and Jane kinds of concepts. Many of you may have been in the whole language group where we really developed uh, through reading, we believe that reading and writing together. But again, these pieces, sometimes we've learned that components and pieces of all of those are really centered around this science, what really works. And so the work of the literacy mentors who work out of CSRE RISA and from the Deal Center, because they do have other work that uh, is going on in other places similar, we really build teacher knowledge around the science of reading. I've put here together for you, so it's in these slides and I'm not gonna take credit because someone else did this and I actually received this at a conference called Plain Talk About Literacy. But here we have these, these the, you see the first four components of reading and each of these is really telling you about the various um, science of reading and what the science of reading again is this body of research. If we, as you'll see, I have each of these numbers are with the reference for the actual um, reference or the, um, so that you know the actual citation and where this work comes from. But what we find out is that whether phonemic awareness phonics, fluency, and vocabulary working together. And again, I'm, I'm not gonna read that to you, uh, but these working together is the what, then why we think about uh, by the end of first grade teachers, if we just look at uh, phonics, for example, students are taught by code-based approach. It was really, this again is helping you understand what's happening in each of those components and how they work together. Uh, to then all of those pieces leading to comprehension. So when we think about our students who are in uh, grades four through 12, or maybe they're struggling reading as adults, many times the gap is there in those early and those four other foundations of reading. And again, this continuum and academic gains, this need for the systemic, explicit, engaging, instruction, this is what's going to make the difference for students and how they really learn to read. So again, these are tools, things that you can have. You can go back and look for yourself. I'm not, uh, this session, unfortunately, we wouldn't have time uh, to do um, the whole science of reading. And again, as I told you, that's, I'm, I'm a learner. I'm a learner. And so again, I've been able to, again, work with my team and my staff to, to build this capacity. And you do have the references there. Going quickly then to the student engagement side of the work, we worked with Dr. Emily Rubin, uh, who uh, works and has is a co-developer of SEEKS. Uh, and SEEKS, really many people think SEEKS is a social emotional curriculum. Again, this is not curriculum. It is a framework that teachers learn how to mentor one another to identify um, the engagement of students. So you work and you're able to assess student engagement. You know how many times we observe a teacher's classroom and we say, you need to engage the students more? Well, I think our teachers would if they know how. The beauty of SEEKS is there is a rubric to evaluate whether students are engaged in the learning. And then we're able to select and talk about among, with our peers. This is really what SEEKS is all about, that we're learned to talk about our peers. What are some strategies that I can do to actually get my initiate that engagement? 
How can I get my students to work independently? And how can I get my students to invest in their own learning? So again, Emily, not a, not a stranger to um, the Deal Center, but again, this approach is centered around reading, uh, that reading brain and around uh, neuro neuroscience. So again, the science of reading and the science of SEEKS very um, closely connected. Uh, but SEEKS, their approach is about appreciative inquiry. So, so different than evaluating teachers. Teachers learn to appreciate the work of others. So even as an evaluator or a former principal, I might be tempted to say what I think was right or wrong. That's not what this is about. This is about saying what went well. And you know the beauty of it, teachers quickly see other things they could do in order to engage students. They begin to identify this themselves. And again, centered the work that Emily has done, again, around active engagement, students actually, actually attending, engaging, whether it's from eye contact to physical engagement around, and again, centered on the universal design for learning. Uh, again, uh, that appreciative inquiry and mentor of teacher to teacher is what makes it so beautiful. Uh, this training uh, develop the training that teachers see gives them this common language and it's for any grade level, any subject. And again, it works at all levels. Uh, we have examples throughout the work with um, Emily from high school math teachers to again, our K-3 reading teachers. Uh, all of the tools are readily accessible. So again, you'll have the link to that in this. Uh, but again, really measuring learner engagement is, an, is a piece that we haven't always had as an educator. People tell us to engage and we think that's sometimes what's happening, but often we're missing this and we're missing that students um, may have this missing link of language. And this may be a reason that they're not attending. So there's so many implications to this work around SEEKS. Uh, again, we've surveyed, you'll have results of this, but all very positive results that we receive from those students that how SEEKS and both reading support their work. Just briefly so that we have time for some um, questions, if you have any, I do wanna just share that uh, again, the passion for reading and the reason this building capacity, because I want you to think about how many of our teachers now at many of our schools and sometimes our most challenged schools. And when I say that, I mean our lower performing schools, schools that may have more percentage of students that are below grade level in reading. They're often struggling to find well-trained teachers. So that's the reason they need an army, it's going to take more than CSRA RISA. It's going to take more than just the RISAs probably that are throughout the state. But we need folks really supporting the teaching of reading around this science of reading and also the opportunities to help teachers have that appreciative inquiry around their own practice so that they grow their practice. So again, an, an entirely different approach. One of the wonderful things we've been able to do and you'll find in the handout is that we've been able to develop some resources. Uh, even prior to me coming to RISA, they already had their writing center, which you'll have a link to in the handout. Uh, just from our website, it's freely accessible, but there are lesson plans um, incorporating in the writing process with reading, uh, with text, a uh, link to it for every, almost every subject in every grade, you'll find there. As part of the pandemic, we developed the website Learn Anyway, where we've turned lessons into online lessons for just about every subject and every grade level. Uh, and also we've had the opportunity to build a reading resource center, uh, freely acceptable, set, accessible, and again, some of the components are under development, but you'll find all of these links on our webpage. Uh, but this Reading Resource Center centered around, again, 
the um, science of reading and around the components of reading. You will find phonological awareness and phonemic awareness as two separate links because we think the body of work there is so great. You'll find uh, the uh, various pillars of reading research and other links from the DOE and Get Georgia Reading, uh, certainly the Deal Center. You'll see all those uh, reading links on our homepage there. Uh, then you'll be able to dive into the various components. Each of these is in a progression because again, we believe that they're wound together. So we're not really different than other sites that might say K or pre-K or third grade. We're saying these components are really necessary for students to be really good readers. So we want teachers to be able to find whatever they're looking for, not just think of them as grade level skills. Um, again, skill progressions, uh, and then they can find out more about those. And again, each page also has some digital links for additional resources. Uh, so then when they click on skill pages, They'll go down, each one kind of starts the same way where there's video support. So this is really supporting that teacher, but it could even support a parent who's teaching students to read at home and working with them. So again, these are all freely accessible. You have instructional resources, professional learning resources, and additional links on each page. I'm bringing us back around as I finish um, today and, and we, but really, to what our role is in Get Georgia Reading. Again, uh, CSRA RESA, we work again for teacher preparation and effectiveness. Again, having uh, both uh, our content literacy as well as foundational literacy, mathematics and other subject, subject area experts, um, as well as uh, certification areas. We certainly work with building a positive learning climate. We work with PBIS, mental health, uh, wraparound services. Uh, again, we have um, that access where we have direct student learning, but we also have support for our schools, especially with our school improvement and working with low performing schools in our area. And then finally with language nutrition, we have this Le uh, professional learning, coaching, and mentoring to help every child. So again, it's going to take more than just one of us. We're just doing one piece right there in our little corner of Georgia. Uh, but again, we invite you always to join us. Anything we have going on, others are welcome. But it's going to take all of us working together. It's this partnership that we've been able to build with the Deal Center. We get Georgia Reading that's allowed us to do anything. And in my life, I've learned that none of this would have been possible for, my, for the work I've done without others, whether it's been the students, their families, and my fellow teachers and colleagues in this work. So we'll stop right here. I know there might be some questions, not sure. And I know our time is probably running pretty close. So uh, Garrett, do you see any questions or anything? And I can stop sharing if that might help. Sure, but I'll sure. leave it there in case somebody needs me to go back to a slide for a minute. Yeah, great idea. Um, so first off, thank you so much for such a powerful presentation. That was excellent. Um, I don't see any questions yet, um, but I do see a comment from Julie Beck, who thanks you for sharing that resource. Uh, she says that she's used the Florida Center for Reading Research many times and is excellent. Um, at this time, I'm going to go ahead and allow you all to unmute yourselves. So if you have any questions or comments or want to share anything with Dr. Alexander, feel free to take the floor at this time. I have a question and a comment. Um, where do you see, um, you're working on teacher preparation. Where do you see our universities and colleges um, fitting in on this partnership um, so that students come out prepared at least with an understanding of social emotional learning as well as the science of reading? Well, I, and, um, was Nora, was that you? I think I saw you unmuted there. Um, yes. 
That I will just tell you, and I can only speak, some others might have some insight from their area, but in our area, we work very closely with Augusta University. Um, and uh, I know that from just the work they've told me that they are really doing some collabor collaboration across the state to really build more where they had gotten away from some of the foundational reading to really build that back into the curriculum for their students. I know in the TAP programs, which we're responsible for in, in many of the RESAs and some other um, districts and various pe people that have the alternative learning programs, we really have our teachers going through those first courses with, with those professional staff in our RESA that, that have developed much of this um, work, like for us in the Reading Resources Center from the foundational work, uh, whether it's um, those pieces that we learn because of our training around dyslexia, but again, that foundational reading that we wanna have teachers really go out and um, be a part of. So I know this is discussion and I'm, I'm just hearing from the Augusta University the work centered around that. And I know I do have the opportunity to sit on some of their advisories and they are really working toward this same goal within their organization, which tells me it's very likely that there would be uh, in our university system that this is a um, priority for them. Well, you know, it, is, yeah, it is mandated by Senate um, 48, Senate yes. Bill 48. Um, and, and I am a professor at a state university and, and a dyslexia therapist. Um, and it, I really am astounded <laughs> at, you know, there's some very basic things like even our phonemic, um, the phonemic awareness, because in your mother language, you don't have to break down to phonemes. My second language learners are actually pretty good because they've been taught um, when they were younger in an ESL classroom. Um, and I've made my, my candidates, I spent a lot of time the first half of the semester with phonemic awareness, about 10 minutes in the beginning of the class, as well as enunciation, because they don't know their phonemes, because it was absent in classrooms for so long. They grew up through our system without having an understanding of these. So I'm glad to hear that you're seeing it in other universities as well. And your presentation, thank you so much for it. I really enjoyed it. Well, thank you. And I do, I just wanna add here that I know that each of you could have done a similar story of telling your story because again, it's a journey. And for me again, because I wasn't an elementary teacher or had that kind of background, I just knew it happened for me. But then when you start seeing that it's not happening for students, I really believe that part of what we have to do again is sharing this message, just like you're doing, you know, putting that those foundational pieces in your class. I think we have to tell this story and this message wherever we're going. Uh, I, I feel compelled to do it. And I think that that's really how we're gonna make a difference. Um, and then we have to do it right where we are. So thank you for sharing, because again, I think we're all excited for the work ahead, but we know it's going to, it's a challenge and not just what we've experienced this past year, but just even when we think about the teacher pipeline. And again, um, as you just mentioned um, that, it's sometimes just lacking. It's a skill that may not have been, you know, very few people may have had even as a child. They might not even be seek and have that knowledge. And then now I'm teaching. Now I'm responsible for this. Any other things, um, Garrett? Uh, there was one more question, Debbie, um, from Cindy Turner. Uh, we do have about three minutes here to answer this one, but um, if you all want to stay on, feel free. I do have a hard stop at 11 though, so I'll be hopping off. Um, so Cindy was wondering if there are plans to implement letters training for teachers as Alabama and North Carolina and others are doing. Uh, Cindy, I probably can't speak to what Georgia is going to implement. I will tell you because I've heard of the great work that 
they've done in Clayton County. I've certainly heard Dr. Ebony Lee and Dr. Morsi Beasley talk about the work where they've had all their teachers trained in Clayton County. And I do know that they, um, now again, I don't know what's happened recently or what will happen, but I know they've been able to get all their schools off the school improvement list. And so they've touted really teaching their teachers how to teach reading as a, as a, as a, a benefit and, and, and the benefits they're seeing. I know other districts, I just heard the superintendent in Fulton County say that he's committed to doing that. I believe I've heard that Bibb County. So I know that some of our counties, and I will tell you because of the excitement and enthusiasm I've had around learning about letters myself and about the work I'm hearing going on across uh, you know, these other states and in our state, I actually have a letters cohort that I was able to do through the Deal Center grant funding that I have going through that right now. So again, we've already uh, an initiated that. I have a cohort of about 30 people. Most of the participants are from our L4GA um, uh, districts. So again, a lot of excitement around there. But the key is, it's based on the science of reading. It's not Contrary to, again, what people think, letters is really an approach to teach teachers how to teach reading. It's not a reading curriculum. It is how to teach teachers how to be well-trained reading teachers, and that's our goal. So I don't know if you want to unmute Cindy or if we have time. I know Garrett's going to leave us, and then I know we all want to go to the second breakout. Now, Garrett, is this going to just end and take us out of the breakout, or we should close out at it's 11 i know it's time is it time for the next session um so debbie the the next session actually starts at 11 15 and this session is now under your control i've assigned the host okay. to you. so uh y'all feel free to chat for the next you know five to ten minutes and uh you can take the reins and again i appreciate you all for joining today Thank you, Garrett. Good luck. I'm going to join that when we finish at 11.15. But Cindy, do you want to unmute and say anything or anyone else about letters? Because that's really all I know. So I can't really speak a lot more to it, but I'm excited to hear again about people teaching teachers to be reading teachers. I think it's the secret. Thank you for that information. I'm happy to see that so many of our Georgia counties are um, embracing the science of reading. So I was just wondering, you know, how prevalent that was. So that was good information. Thank you so much. I'm sure there are others that I don't even know about. <laughs> well, anytime you have a structured literacy class like Letters, like Wilson, like Orton Gillingham and many others, it's the language, it's the systematic language of English. So any curriculum that you're given and you've been taught the structure of language, you can adapt it yeah. to the science of reading uh, because it's the English language. So that's, they're teaching us the rules of the English language, how our language came to be, and those spelling rules, especially in letters is spelling um, around that and how we can incorporate this for our students. So any of these structured literacy programs, and you can go to the IDA website, and get a list of them um, and, and the IDA Georgia website. Um, and they're good with any curriculum because if you know the structure of our language, you can adapt it to any curriculum you're given. Thank you. And I'm not, can you identify who's speaking? Because I, for some reason, I think I'm still sharing my screen. I couldn't oh, say it. It's, uh, it's Nora Schlesinger. Okay, thank you again for sharing that. I think that's a great. And again, those of you who have, such strong background in this area you're teaching all of us so again I just appreciate you so much sharing that and being a part of this uh is there any um more I don't want to keep you because I know you might have something to do before you get into the next session um and and so I do see that um uh, Dr. McRoy, you ask about the charts and things. Everything is in the PowerPoint. I will just tell you that I took it as I've been working since I turned it into the Deal Center. It's in a little different order, but you have everything that I shared today. And then in the handout, you just have some information about those links uh, that we have 
readily accessible at CSRA Risa. It was great to see you all today. I feel honored that you would come. Those who know me, I feel honored that you would join in uh, because you do know me. So uh, again, and those of you I didn't haven't had the pleasure to meet, it's a pleasure to meet you and thank you so much. And uh, again, my um, at, I'm just D Alexander at csraresa.org. I'm not sure that information is anywhere, uh, but I would love to hear from you. And again, uh, just uh, have a wonderful rest of the day here at the Deal Center. So.